I've finally done it. The blueprint for the perfect business to start in 2024. And it is time travel. Oh, oh, yes. In this video, we're covering the best businesses for 1784, including carpentry, selling lumber, fixing people's shoes, and my personal favorite, spying on those filthy red coats. Hello, what's that? Colin, is that you? Yeah, I'm in the past. I don't know, like 248 years ago. Oh, you said 2024. The video said 1784, dude. Honest mistake, project management software, you know? Uh, I don't know, man. Yeah, I figured out time travel too. Yeah, it's pretty nice here. Boston's pretty sick, dude, I love it. It's pretty cool, lots of cool people, yeah. Oh, what? Stop, stop wasting time on the intro. YouTube doesn't like that. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'll come back. Yep, okay, love you, bye. Okay, so choosing the right business to start for yourself in 2024 is based on staying on the cutting edge of technology, but while also using these tried and true monetization methods. So not some hack or shiny thing like drop shipping Amazon FBA or using faceless AI videos or YouTube automation or something that doesn't really require a real strategy, but something that gives you the highest chances of success that could be a real business and that actually works. That's why in this video, I'm covering my favorite business that I'd start in 2024 to make real money online. Before we get started, I wanna invite you to watch my free masterclass, 80 minutes of free training exactly what it takes to start your online business. Click the link in the description below, sign up for that, and let's get into it. So first, let's talk about online business in general. So when you go to YouTube, you look for business ideas or ways to make money online. There's a lot of shiny hacks, right? Ways to make money in 24 hours, passive income, things that promise overnight success. There's affiliate marketing, ads, drop shipping, the easy, lazy way to make money online. And the truth is when you start looking for ways to make money in 24 hours, your actions become a lot different than if you actually are trying to build a real business, right? The things that you're doing, you're building your foundation on kind of like a house of cards is easily gonna get toppled over. But think of this like Shark Tank, right? What is a tangible business? Well, it's typically one that has a product to sell or a service to sell, right? There's a product in the market, you sell it, you're a business. It's really that simple. So a real business is one that has ownership of products and services. So the highest lever you can pull eventually is selling your own product or services. The problem is when we're just starting as beginners, we don't know what that perfect product or service is, especially in this attention economy. So the thing is, it requires an audience and attention. Any business requires attention in order to actually sell the thing that they're selling. So ultimately though, you can't just sell a product to no audience. So while you're building this audience, right, we need to develop and create the right revenue streams for our business in the right order. Right? We wouldn't sell a course to zero people. We don't have anyone in our email list yet. But there's other revenue streams that we can do in the correct order, especially if you're a beginner starting from zero. For example, when we're talking about our own product, it's things like not the old days of eBooks and info products and things that are kind of low value, but things that are high value. So things like valuable courses with communities, coaching, all of those kind of things. Let's take a couple looks real quick at a couple examples. So like here's Jeffrey's channel, right? On just a YouTube channel with 63,000 subscribers, not a huge channel by any means in uh, the grand scheme of things, but he has uh, videos on relationships, right? So he's he has his own relationship course that he sells high value with a community and he makes six figures a month doing that to the best of my knowledge, right? Lots of revenue from a relatively small channel. Same thing can be true of my channel. You know, I have 165,000 subscribers, nothing that crazy when it comes to YouTube, but we make a lot of money by affiliate marketing, ads in the videos, and also selling our own products and services in the videos, right? So it's a great thing. Or, you, you know, look at the fitness niche, right? Tons of different fitness people like Ryan here who is looking jacked. He has a ton of different videos but he also sells his own fitness training, right, through YouTube. So it's really about courses, communities, selling your own product that way when we're talking about our own product. We're not like creating necessarily an e-commerce product. We're creating information and teaching an audience. And we can use a platform like School to do that, S-K-O-O-L. So School's really good, that's what we use. Like you just drop all your videos in, your video content, your courses, then there's a tab for the community. There's a tab for like live Q&As, the classroom, calendar, all of that stuff. So it's really good, that's the one that we use. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about a business with our own product here. Actually training, videos, courses, things that you can create and put out there in the world. Now you can't just create them once and then you know expect people to keep buying them year after year. You do have to update them regularly, but it's not like you're building an e-commerce brand with a prototype and trying to get people, you know, spending a bunch of money up front on it. It's just creating video content, educational training is the product we're talking about. So however though, we need visibility and attention on our stuff in order to get enough people 
to see us, know we exist, click on us, follow us, click an affiliate link or purchase something from us. This is true of any YouTuber, any blogger. This is true of the biggest companies in the world. We need people to know we exist in order to buy things from us. So let's talk about the attention economy, right? So everyone is on TikTok and Instagram, right? And they all have accounts and people are really just publishing tons of stuff. There's like a sea of content on TikTok and Instagram, right? Real short videos and all that stuff. However, I would argue that most people aren't really, you know, making money on there. Right? They might be trying to or trying to be an influencer or publishing a lot of content, but it's just not necessarily working. So it's also important that we choose, you know, when we're building a business, we choose the correct platform to actually be on that can actually make us the most money. And again, this is not about like just creating random content and entertaining people, right? Instagram has tons of content of just good looking people, but are you going to buy something from them? Same thing is true with TikTok, like funny entertainment videos with millions of views, they might get laughs and stuff, but like, how are they getting monetized? Right? We can't just rely on these ad networks to pay us. That's 100% algorithm driven. So that's the thing too, is like when we're getting attention in the attention economy, we have to know how the algorithm works on each individual platform, whether it's TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, a website, right? With Google's algorithm. So we have to discover if we're gonna choose the right revenue streams in the right order, which platforms do we actually choose first? So first let's cover YouTube. And YouTube I really like because you actually can get attention, build a true audience of fans. And the key here is actually educating people, not just entertaining them. You could create a simple setup like this where you're just talking to a camera, educating an audience on a certain topic. And in that you give, uh, you open up so many more revenue streams in your life than just like a comedy channel. A comedy channel or music videos or something like that, like people are just gonna watch it and ad revenue is pretty much the only one that they can do there or you know getting big sponsors on like a comedy podcast but if you're providing helpful information and teaching something on youtube or through a blog specifically we're talking about youtube here each video is kind of like a mini lesson and the goal here is lead generation so the goal is get people from youtube from a source into your email list right and you can do keyword based videos like doing keyword research to find videos you actually get lots of video views over time too from a backlog of old videos so like you're not just getting a bunch of views and then the video dies you're actually getting consistent steady views so the bigger your backlog of content the more consistent monthly and daily views you're getting same thing is true of google and blogging if you start ranking for something you can usually rank month after month after month so the key is building your email list on youtube by teaching something helpful providing a lead magnet same thing is true with blogging so let's cover blogging so blogging you're providing helpful written content each blog post can be like a mini lesson like how to do a certain thing and the goal here is also lead generation right which you can do an exit intent pop-up when somebody visits your blog they see an exit intent pop-up or things throughout you do keyword research right ranking stability i've had different articles on my blog that have ranked for years and made me you know five figures a month for a very long and consistent amount of time and with the blog organic seo is the foundation so that's actually getting traffic from google and you can also use like text-based tools like LinkedIn and Twitter, right? So those are other secondary platforms you can use to build a newsletter and get people into your website, right? So having just a blog by itself, a website can work, yes, but we also like need to think of organic SEO as just one traffic source. There's also YouTube, there's also social media, Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these different avenues and places that people are going when we're trying to build attention for our business. The key here is though, whether it's YouTube or blogging is both of these businesses require ongoing and consistent attention, not just attention for a month and then it fizzles away and dies not like a flash in the pan right because when we're starting it's really simple if you're starting a youtube channel you create two types of videos informational how to do stuff teaching and transactional maybe like best products in your niche with affiliate links in the youtube description those two types same thing if you're a blogger two types of posts you'll ever need to write how to do stuff and the products you need to do those things right it's really that simple so the key is ongoing and consistent attention which means you need a content plan a way to publish at least something once a week, right? In a consistent basis and just keep doing it because we need a steady flow of content, just getting ourselves out there no matter what type of business we have, right? Even if we're a dentist's office or a law firm, we need some type of content being put out in the world to let people know that we exist. So as we're covering these business frameworks and we're thinking about the business to actually start, the number one business, we have to realize that all businesses run on lead generation and email marketing. That's where most sales come from. So the key here is turning the attention that we're gaining from one of these platforms into some type of ownership, right? Because once they join our email, email list, we actually own that email and it's something that we can market to and it's something that is in our direct control. So let's look at this graphic for a second, right? On the left side, we have attention 
And then on the right side, we have monetization. So we all have to go from, we don't exist, we have no audience, no traffic, whether we're a blogger or a YouTuber or social media person. We have no audience, no attention. So what do we actually do to get to monetization? Well, first, we have these platforms here. We have things like that people are on, right? YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, all of these different third party or second party platforms where we have an account. We don't own the platform. We can't control if they go belly up or they go away, but these are unowned assets. And this is where most traffic and attention for a business is obtained, right? Through unowned assets. Now we have to take people and attention from those unowned assets and we can generate some revenue sources just from these unowned assets, right? We can make ad revenue just from YouTube. We can get people to click affiliate links just from YouTube. We don't need a product, right? We can create a video on how to build a shed and we have 10 affiliate links to all the things, framing hammers and power tools and all kinds of things and affiliate links in the description. You can make a bunch of money just by living on this platform, YouTube, right? You never have to leave it. You don't have to have your own product. You don't need a website. You could stop here and you can generate these things, some better than others, which is why I made YouTube a little bit bigger than other, other, these, uh, other unowned assets. But number one is you have attention on these unowned assets. Number two is you have to get them into the email list, which is your owned asset. So there's different strategies for each one, right? If it's YouTube, it's kind of how I did it in the beginning of this video. Make sure to click the link in the description below, sign up for the 80 minute free training. You have to provide real value, just like my 80 minute free training does. You don't have to buy anything. You never have to buy anything if you don't want to. You can watch all my YouTube videos. You never have to buy a single thing. But if you want to, you can join my email list. You can learn more for free, right? And then if you enjoy that, then we'll provide options to work with us in a paid format because information can't all be free, right? But an email list is your own asset. So through YouTube, it's talk about it, link in the description. For a blog post, it's exit intent pop-ups, getting people to sign up for a lead magnet that way. For Instagram, what I'm seeing lately is people have a post something simple, a video, they have a caption, and then they say, uh, in the caption, they talk about something, and then they say, hey, comment below with start and to get started, right? So it's an auto DM feature with a tool like ManyChat. So somebody automatically comments, they say learn, they get an auto DM going to an opt-in page. So all of this, YouTube, blog posts, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, everything that you're doing goes to a single opt-in page where you're getting people's email address and it's optimized for conversion. You're getting, you know, with a lead magnet, something you're providing in your niche that's helpful and useful. You know, I remember I was learning some woodworking. I know nothing about it. So I started Googling things and looking stuff up on YouTube. And there's this guy, he had a YouTube channel, a blog, he was combining both. And he said, uh, you know, you sign up for the free email list and you get access to my 10 best you know woodworking tools that every beginner needs i'm like well that'd be, that could be interesting i'll do that and then over time i saw he was selling like a 200 hundred dollar course on woodworking so it was really well laid out but the key is like you're getting people off these platforms into an email list that you actually own because you can market to your own email list you have a csv file with all those people in there you can market to them as long as they remain in the list and don't unsubscribe and a blog kind of lives in the middle here because a blog is an owned asset and that's the key right and a blog is good because your opt-in page can live on the blog, right? You don't have to have a random click funnels page that looks really spammy, but you can have your own name.com. You can have blog posts. You own all those things, which is why I really like blogging. Like you don't own Google. That's true. However, if you have a blog, you own that with web hosting, right? You own the web hosting. That is your website. No one can take it from you. No one can delete it offline. You own it. And you can also send and get people into your email list, which is why I have it in the middle. But ultimately, all of these attention sources for a business, you're taking them and you're getting them into the email list, and then that generates sales. So that generates course sales, sponsors. You could have sponsors in your email list, right? If you have a huge email list, 100,000 people, there's newsletter businesses that make, you know, some of them make upwards of six figures a month just from sponsors, which is crazy. They send a bunch of emails. They have a sponsorship strategy, but ultimately it's sponsorships and courses. You're selling your own information through the email list and that's where it's done. It's not done directly from YouTube or directly from a blog post, but you have to get them into an email list first. So the key in all of this, whatever business we're starting is to obtain attention from a secondary platform, put it into an owned asset, and then sell your own actual product. That's what a real business is. Now the key here, as you'll see, is that these four revenue streams are the primary four revenue streams of any content creator. So you can start with just the attention ones on the left side, affiliate and ad revenue. So for example, you could have just a blog and just post things about like the best golf clubs, the best drivers, the best putters, how to swing chip putt, all of those types of articles, generate affiliate revenue, 
get ad revenue from banner ads and then stop there, right? Just do that. Or on YouTube, you can do the same thing. You can teach things, you can have affiliate links, ad revenue and stop there, right? So that's kind of one way of doing it. The downside of that is that you're 100% reliant on the algorithm. So if the algorithm goes away and you don't have anyone on your email list, you're kind of stuck, right? If YouTube changes something, if Google changes something as they have recently, you're stuck in this affiliate ad world and you're kind of stuck and you have to pivot, right? So how do you pivot? You have to pivot into something that you control more directly, which an email list with courses and actually owning that email list is something that you more directly control because you have access to it. You can have your own sales effort behind it. But the thing is you can do all of these revenue streams you just have to do them in the right order. So yes, we don't do courses first because it doesn't make sense. We don't have that attention yet. So we can do affiliate first by creating how-to informational content and transactional best product roundup type content, whether on YouTube or through a blog, right? Make that affiliate revenue first as we're building up our audience, building the email list. And then once we build it to a certain size and we have the first two sources of revenue, then we introduce the course once people are really interested already in it and you've built up that audience. So this thing, this takes time, you know, there's no get rich quick schemes online. You can get to all these revenue streams, but again, it's not like every hack. It's like, let's hack it to drop shipping and, you know, do something on with a Facebook ad that's immediately going to work. That's not how you build a real business. You build it with real attention, real brand, and actually building real revenue streams in and doing it in the right order. So there's a reason we don't go after sponsors first. We don't have any audience to sell sponsors for, right? There's a reason we don't do courses first. We can do affiliate because it dictates our initial content strategy. It allows us to pu publish content and make mistakes, right? Update things. You look at anyone's old YouTube videos, the oldest ones, and they're always the worst because they're just learning. And that's what we have to do. We have to get over the starting line and just start learning either blogging or YouTube or both because that is where people actually buy stuff, right? They make purchase decisions. They're looking for people to be the middleman or middle woman between a search in their head. They're the search intent driven platforms to actually make money on. It's the reason that there's so many people on Instagram and TikTok, but they're not really making much money compared to YouTubers are making a ton of money, especially the ones selling their own product and blogs make a ton of money still because Google search is just getting you know, there's more searches every single year. All right, so we get it. We need attention and we need to sell people stuff. That's what an online business is in 2024. So which one would I choose? How would I do it? Well, first we have to know what kind of content are we creating? What niche do I choose? Which is the most common question that I always get. What is the most profitable niche to get into through YouTube or through blogging? What is it? Well, we first have to think about we need a keyword and content assembly method, right? We can't just publish something and expect it to go viral and then quit a couple days later. We have to create an actual content strategy based on things that people are actually searching for. We have to find market sweet spots, areas that aren't too competitive, that we actually know, right? That we actually can talk about. We don't have to be an expert, but areas that we know and areas that are new, emerging, and trending. So for example, if I was uh, looking for keywords to either write content about or videos about, and I want to do it in crypto, I could search like best crypto. I could go to the matching terms tool and I could see what other stuff's here. Well, if I want to write about like the best crypto wallet or trading platform or, you know, the best crypto to invest in, we can see the difficulty is really high here. It's quite competitive. What if we drop that down to 20 and then we say, okay, difficulty, let's look for easier things. So something like uh, the best crypto credit card, that could be something I could write about, right? That could be a market sweet spot. There's probably not a lot of people with crypto credit cards. The difficulty is pretty small, right? or best crypto to day trade, or all these different things. Or you could even do best is like transactional. You could do how plus crypto and drop that difficulty down. And then you could see like, you could write about, you know, how to use crypto.com, how to short crypto, how to buy new crypto before listing. So there's still opportunities out there. You don't have to know how to spot them. What's key is knowing a little bit more about your niche. So for example, maybe instead of crypto, you say DeFi, which is a term, right? How to invest in DeFi how crypto developer DeFi, like you actually know some more terms, right? Like web three, you're looking for new things. How, uh, let's see something like how to access web three, how to use web three, how to build a web three website. So you start looking for these unique opportunities, but we have to know where the opportunity is for every single niche because it's a little bit different. So for example, if you're getting into crypto and that's your thing and that what you, that's what you want your niche to be, I would say be one of those YouTubers that talks over the charts, gives strategies, 
and eventually has their own community on Telegram or Discord or something like that. Because blogging, it's really competitive. You're going to go up against coin market cap and these giant websites talking about the crypto and you become like kind of like a news site where you have to constantly say, here's what we want to invest in in December, January, February, March. So that opportunity on crypto is more like on YouTube than it is just through straight up blogging. But let's think of another niche. Like let's say we want to be known for or have a product around like prepping or emergency survival type stuff or outdoor stuff, right? Well, you could look at like best prepping, right? But there, there might be some matching terms in here, like best foods for prepping, best prepping books. Like there's a couple things, but the, the search volume in general is low for that term. The difficulty is average, a little bit low, but we need to know, like, again, this is where niche experience comes in. So if you're prepping for the apocalypse and you're hunkering down, and you think society is gonna collapse, what do you actually search for? You might search for some prepping stuff. You might search for shit hitting the fan. You might search for that, or you might actually need to know some of the products, right? So you might search for like uh, best emergency food. That's something we need, food supply, water. So best emergency food supplies. Those are things you could talk about on YouTube or blogging, right? Or we could say like something like a ham radio or a CB radio or something when society's down and the, you know, the, the attack starts and there's no communication anywhere, you need some type of radio, right? So ham radio, look at all these different articles or videos you could create about this. Or what about something like best home defense? Best home defense shotgun, difficulty of two, tons of search volume, not a lot of people talking about this stuff. Pistol for home defense, rifle, 12 gauge, tons of different opportunities here when it comes to blogging or YouTube. Or what about something like a freeze dryer? So if you wanna really, really prep, and save all of your food like you can use a freeze dryer to do that where you put this they're pretty expensive too like two to three thousand five thousand dollars you put the food in it freeze dries it you put it in packets last for 30 years look at that expensive product you could rank for this specific keyword best freeze dryer there's decent search volume here very low difficulty and then if we look down you can see there's like a site with a domain rating no authorities three something like bluealpinefreezedryers.com it's a good sign something you can rank for so that is a market sweet spot where yeah you could do a youtube channel about prepping there's a lot of them talking about different strategies for survival defense all of that or you could also do a blog with this like this is probably one of the best ones for blogging because big media sites aren't in here it's not too saturated you start creating content around different things like the home defense stuff, food stuff, water, all of that different kind of content on a blog or a YouTube channel. And then eventually you sell your own product. You know, you build your email list up and you can sell your own course on survival or on prepping. So as you can see, like the niche kind of dictates the opportunity. Like if I was in fitness, I wouldn't want to go up against bodybuilding.com and write articles on the best chest workouts, right? I'd, or, you know, I'd probably want to go on YouTube and eventually sell my own fitness program right, or go after things that aren't as competitive. Like there's a ton of different exercises that big sites haven't written about, like different random arm workouts that you might not have heard of, or different types of protein powder, like best protein powder for weight loss or some random stuff like that, right? So we have to know based on the niche that you're entering, what type of business actually makes the most sense. So like I said, crypto probably makes more sense to be on YouTube than it does to be in a blog. Whereas outdoor prepping stuff might make more sense to be on a blog than it does to be on YouTube. And ultimately it also comes down to you, right? What do you want to do? Are you more comfortable on video? Do you want to create a website? That is a big factor too, and your experience level. So when it comes to content assembly, like if you're blogging, you go after one keyword for one article, you have probably 80% of your articles are just informational and helpful. 10% maybe, 10 to 20% are transactional best roundup type posts because we know now we need a lot more informational content to be as helpful as possible. We don't wanna be just seen as an affiliate site. And then you should have some articles too that are just no SEO, no keywords at all, just the most helpful possible content for an audience, right? And then you publish those. You use a tool like Surfer SEO to write the content. You publish it and you can update it over time. You, use, uh, you wanna have a lot of human experience in there, like images, stuff like that. With YouTube, you also wanna, you know, a content strategy. You can go after specific keywords, good video ideas. This comes from a thumbnail and title strategy. Getting people to click your thumbnails is oftentimes more important than the actual video itself, right? So we need the right video length to get people to watch it and retain them. And we need the good thumbnail for people to click through. But on YouTube, we need just a standard strategy so that you can publish things once a week at least. Right, that's kind of the minimum to enter the game for some of these educational type of channels. So you have a set schedule, and what's kind of nice with this is like for me, I do both. I have a blog and a YouTube channel. YouTube, I batch my time 
So I might be able to shoot, you know, all the videos for the month within a couple of days, right? Send them to an editor and then I'm kind of done with that part. So I can segment my time a lot easier with YouTube where I'm shooting stuff, planning and shooting stuff, bucket that into a few days out of the month and then focus on blog content, running businesses, all the revenue streams and all of that in my other time. So content never stops really for a business, right? It can be outsourced eventually. You can't have other people do it for you, right? But YouTube, it's harder to outsource because I still have to make these videos. So ultimately you create a content, what I call the content assembly line method, because we know not every single article is gonna rank, not every single YouTube video is gonna work out. We just need consistency. We don't need to go viral, we just need consistency. So once we've done that for a while and we have some affiliate revenue coming in, we've joined the programs, then it's time to actually create our offer. Right, because this is time, we're building our email list up to say a few thousand people, it doesn't have to be that big, but we can now create uh, our own offer. So to, to create an offer, you really have to deeply understand the niche that comes down to the competition, the products, the pricing of those, how you can be better, how you can differentiate yourself. And what's interesting, all of this stuff works together. You have to understand pricing and offers and all of that before you might even think about what niche, niche you're gonna be in because that might change things a little bit, which is why I do recommend personal branding. Now we have to talk about the price and value equation when we're creating offers. So there's a price for your product and then there's the value that that product provides. Now we always want the value to be substantially higher than the actual price, right? So how can you create something that is worth, you know, the price is $500, but it's worth actually 5,000 when it comes to the teachings or 50,000 even if you're really going above and beyond. And it really comes down to, well, what can the potential customer gain out of this access to this information, right? Can they gain the skills to build a million dollar business with this information? Well, then you could probably charge a premium. If you're teaching them how to knit or crochet, in the other hand, maybe you charge a few hundred bucks, but it's not, the value isn't they're gonna make money, right? In some niches. So the hobby ones, typical hobby type offers and things like that, like woodworking, knitting, gardening, those types of informational products are more like, you know, 100 to $500 range because we're not gonna like change our life, make a bunch of money uh, by doing those, you know, what we're, what we're taught in there. The ones that make the most money are typically ones around making money because they have a direct ROI for the customer if they actually follow through on the strategy. That's another story because most people don't actually follow through, finish a course and actually do everything, but you know, the people that do can actually find some success. So again, the value has to be really high. The price has to be low compared to the market, right? You don't want to be lower than the competition just because you want to undercut them, right? If your content is more valuable, you actually want to be priced a lot higher than them because you're a premium offering in the niche, but you have to understand the niche, right? And this comes over time. So don't worry. Don't worry about any of this stuff. We build this, these skills over time, right? We're not going to be worrying about creating an offer right away but we have to know the price and value equation. So we also have to think of outlining the course. Like what would the best framework be to think of our product kind of like an educational curriculum? That's how I planned blog growth engine. That's how we planned YouTube growth engine was like, hey, how do I take somebody that's a very beginner at this and then go through in a phased approach with 10 different phases and 40 hours of video content in the right order, teaching the right things and eventually learning more and more hands-on into the right training to get them to where they need to be. So you really just think of it, you know, outlining uh, a course is pretty simple. You know, you can create pitch slides, you can do use Trello and just kind of think of what order the, the information should be in, you know, simple 10 to 20 videos at first to kind of make it, make people go through the process. But really it's just, you know, that depends on the niche as well. But you have to outline the course, you have to shoot the course, right? Shooting is simple. It's pretty much the same setup I have here. Turn a camera on, get some lights, shoot the videos. And then of course, you know, using something like school as the course community. So school's the best. I've tried other ones. We tried lots of different online course platforms, but school was the best for us because it's just so simple. The UX is good. You get students in there, they sign up, they pay, they automatically get them into the, into the course right away. They can view the classroom tab, you know, uh, the community, they can interact like a forum. There's ways to like pull people, all kinds of cool stuff. And that's really where things are going. It's more about the community and the value of that than it is about the actual video content because yes, people pirate courses, right? They're like, here's 10 hours of this course, but you don't get any of the assignments, the community, the actual like live Q and A's and events and things like that that are really valuable. So that's kind of when you're thinking about creating an offer, 
the biggest first decision is like, what's the price? What is the actual transformation? Because that's the key. What is the transformation of the student when you're creating an offer? Are they going to start here and then learn how to make, you know, a thousand dollars a month doing this thing? Or are they going to start as a beginner woodworker and then become an intermediate woodworker? And what is that worth? And who else is offering it? And how can I make mine better? People want results fast, right? They want results right away. So that's kind of the tricky thing. We have to provide an offer is always composed of like the transformation and how quickly they can make the transformation. And then under that is like, well, how much does it actually cost? Now the key after you have an offer is to, you know, launch the offer. There's a whole launch strategy you can do, but to make consistent sales, we need to think about lead generation and actually making the sale. So you've captured the lead, right? You've gotten them from YouTube to an email list. Well, now what do you actually do? Well, when you're first starting out as a beginner, you just provide as much helpful content through that email list as possible without selling anything, right? It's about building trust. I spent like two years building my email list before I sold anything really. It was a simple automated welcome sequence of seven emails. I had a word, like it was about blogging. So it was a seven day WordPress blog launch checklist, right? It was a simple PDF I got somebody create on Fiverr. And then through that, I had a seven day email series that just was completely free. Gave them these, you know, the strategies, exactly what to do and all that. Very simple, free lead magnet. And I got my email list to like 40 something thousand people by doing that before I launched a course. But the thing is like, okay, we build trust. We, we want to keep you know interacting with people we can build it like if you're just starting out at the very beginning and you have like five people in the email list don't worry about like oh i gotta send them something right like wait till you have hundreds of people may maybe before you worry about creating that uh, welcome sequence you can use something like convert kit free account and just like set it up right so don't worry about it too much but how it works is basically you have a lead generation so you have a lead magnet which can be a video course it can be a pdf it can be a checklist it can be really anything that's just valuable and helpful in your niche that you're giving them because an email getting an email is a trade right they are trading their email for your access to your information then you have an email series so it's automated so you don't have to like send all these marketing emails individually you write them once and then it's timed so once they enter the email list they get them in a timed sequence and then over time, once you have the offer, you get them into the time sequence, you provide more and more value, and then you offer your offer, right? And you send them to an actual web page. So you send them to a sales page and they can buy something uh, on that sales page. You talk about the unique value propositions. You know, there's entire, <laughs> there's entire other courses on sales copywriting and all the psychology behind it. But you get people to a sales page, they buy it, they check out, they go to the checkout page, they buy it, and that's it. So the goal is to get them buy, uh, to buy it on their own. Right? It's called self-service checkout. So that's what we primarily use, right? Just no sales effort behind it. Just get them into the email sequence, automated emails, and get them to buy it on their own. They get into the course on their own. Everything's covered, right? The things, the main things that we focus on in that is like the actual coaching and people in the community to help our students. That's the biggest thing that we focus on there. So it works at scale. This works at scale, but you need that scale for this to work. You need a lot of traffic, ongoing and consistent leads every single day coming in to have a conversion rate. Like let's say your conversion rate's 2%. Well, to get two sales a day, you'd have to have 100 leads coming in a day into your email list, which means you probably need, you know, at a 10% conversion rate, at least a thousand, thousands of views on your stuff to get that many people to opt in every single day. So it's a numbers game and you can do it in the automated sales funnel way where you have, you know, secondary sources, into an opt-in page could be click funnels could be your website they sign up for the email list get the welcome series send them to a sales page they check out they get into the community that has the most technology it has the most software right that you would need and it is the most automated and passive i hate the word passive income because it doesn't exist but it's the most passive in a way that like they can check out on their own and buy it but there's also another way like if you're just starting you could do a simple sales approach where you go YouTube directly to like a Calendly page to get them to book a call. And then you just close the call, you know, close the sale over the phone or on Zoom, right? That could be a lot simpler. Let's say you're charging a thousand dollars for your product and you close, your close rate is like something on the lower end, like even like, let's say 25%. Well, if you want to make $10,000 a month, you'd need to do 40 calls, which would be 10 calls a week. So you just set up 10 hours a week, set up calls and do it that way. If your close rate's like 50% and you can get people on a Calendly link directly from your blog or YouTube, then you're looking at like, hey, I could make, you know, what if I wanted to make 10 sales a week? I could do 20 calls a week. 
which would be like 20 hours, a part-time job, right? But you could be making 10 sales a week, which would be $40,000 a month if we would do the math on that, right? So the numbers are easier on sales. You can also learn a lot at first doing it this way from the customers and ask them like, hey, what do you really need? What do you want? Because that's a big part of your offer is like surveying the email list, figuring out what people actually want. So there's two ways to do it. You can start with simple sales, send people from your content directly to Calendly and just talk to them, offer them something. And then eventually over time, build in this more automated sequence with emails and funnels. All right, so we've covered a lot so far, but I still haven't answered the question, what is the number one business I would actually start in 2024? So let's actually get into that. So I would start a personal brand blog. I would use WPX and I would use WordPress.org with the cadence theme. So I would have have a website. I would have to create a website. Even if you have a YouTube channel, you still need a website, right? To get people into opt-in lists and sell stuff and affiliate links can help. It, it can help with all of that. So I would find market sweet spots. I would find keywords that I could rank for on Google in 2024 and a niche that I can dominate. So again, I kind of like that prepping example. I like a lot of that stuff. I might make a blog and a YouTube channel on that. I'd create a consistent content assembly line. So that would be Consistent content at least once a week to be in the game. So that would be at least one uh, blog post per week, one YouTube video per week. And then I would uh, ratio that and I do 70% 70 to 80% informational content, uh, 20% transactional best of roundup posts about the products, and then 10% just straight up no SEO, no keyword research. I'm just creating the best possible content for an audience. I would add exit and 10 pop-ups to my blog with a lead magnet going to an offer eventually. I'd have a welcome email sequence providing that. I'd couple it with YouTube. So uh, I would use YouTube to build up my email list in the exact same way. So it would be multiple points of entry into one landing page. I'd create this YouTube channel on a niche that I know a lot about. Like I've started learning more about the outdoor survival stuff because I live out in the woods now. <laughs> and uh, I think it's way less competitive than you know, starting a blog like I did about blogging and software like I did in 2019. I don't think that would be a smart move in 2024. And I'd, put it, I'd start by putting the Calendly link in my YouTube description and uh, top comment going to the opt-in page where the Calendly link is. I'd close sales myself. I'd open up 10 slots a week in my calendar, only 10 hours a week of work, uh, 40 calls a, a month. I'd try to close 20 sales a month to get to 20, uh, probably a $500 product. I think would actually be better. So I'd probably do 20 sales a month, 500 bucks, 10K a month on YouTube sales. I'm closing five sales a week, typical sales numbers. I couple you know, my YouTube channel and growth with uh, ad sponsorships, affiliate links. So my aim would be to make like, let's say $30,000 a month actually. I'd, I'd wanna make 10,000 a month for my own product sales, which would just be like 20 simple sales a month, 10,000 from affiliate marketing between my blog and YouTube channel, which, isn't that much when you consider the hundreds of articles I could eventually create and video content. And then I get a couple sponsors at 10K a month as well. So two sponsors, um, I probably charge, you know, maybe at first when my channel's smaller, 2,500 per sponsorship times four would be $10,000 a month. So multiple revenue streams, but I create a real personal brand around something, right? That's what I would do because personal branding is actually a way that you can pivot, you can adapt your content, and that is the number one business in 2024. It's not some tiny niche site. It's not drop shipping where you're creating a random product from China and then creating a Facebook ad to sell it. It's not YouTube automation or faceless YouTube videos, right? It's actually something that becomes a real business, right? So you have the power to become a real business. I would get into something in a niche that I know about, that I can create content around in a blog and YouTube channel, and I could make, you know, 30,000 a month relatively quickly. You know, it might take me a solid year, six months to a year to get to those numbers if I really accelerated it and spent a lot of time on it. But I'd be making over $300,000 a year running a simple online business that I run with maybe one writer and one video editor. So that's what I would do if I was starting over um, and didn't have the now four businesses that I own currently. So I don't really have the time for that. The thing is, if you're working full time, most people quit before ever making it full-time with their business, right? So that's another thing. When you're deciding a business to start in 2024, do one that you're not gonna quit because it's so easy to quit something that's not tied to your identity, like a small niche site or a faceless YouTube channel or some hack dropshipping site, right? If it stops working, what usually happens is you're excited about the opportunity, you're really pumped about it, you try it, you realize, oh shit, this is actually a lot harder than I thought it was. I actually need an, I need ongoing and consistent attention in marketing. This is what I did with drop shipping. I started a drop shipping store that I'm like, I started doing some Facebook posts and a few ads and stuff. I'm like, oh my God, I need way more attention than I realized in order to make this work. So I quit, 
because it wasn't tied to my identity, it was just random products. But when you tie it to your identity, you can even start this thing as a digital resume. Maybe a blog or a website or a YouTube channel will help you get a better job. Maybe it's something you can attach to your resume. But the thing is, that's how I started. Once my website at my name started making affiliate revenue, it was making software sales, right? So I got that to like $80,000 in software affiliate sales a month. And then I realized I don't wanna just be stuck in that attention world of only relying on affiliate and ad revenue. So I partnered with my business partner, Colin, and now we're like, let's do YouTube. Let's sell our own products. Let's do all of these different things. Let's build communities. Let's create multiple LLCs and build all of these things out because we can, because it's fun, right? But I couldn't have done that at the very beginning. So again, the revenue streams business in general, especially online business, it takes time. You need to expand your timeline a little bit, realize you're not gonna get rich in 90 days. It's just not gonna happen. However, you can start making money in 90 days and you can be rich in a couple of years if you follow a consistent content plan. The key is most people don't want to because it's like, will this actually work? Am I guaranteed results? What if it doesn't take off? I'm gonna quit. So the key is you attach it to your identity. You find a niche that you're actually interested in that has monetization potential and that can make you money for five years, 10 years and beyond, right? So the business I would start is a personal brand in 2024. I would tie it to a niche that I know about that I could create lots of content around and that I could go from affiliate and ad revenue to selling my own product to building multiple revenue streams into my life. So if that was interesting to you, if you wanna learn more exactly what I would do in a deeper uh, way, make sure to click the link in the description below, sign up for the free masterclass, 80 minutes of free training exactly what it takes. I hope you found the video helpful. Please like it for the algorithm. I'd really appreciate it. If you made it this far, you might as well just click the like button, right? I really appreciate that. Subscribe to the channel and I will see you in another video.